Pause. We can hear George. No, he's turned off. And his lights turned off as well. Very we can't see him either. There, there you go. He's moved over to the dark side. <laughs> yeah, no there's lighting. no lighting on here. I don't know what's going on, but anyway. But there's power, obviously. There's power, but uh, yeah, the lights aren't working. Mm. I don't know what's going on there. But anyway. Um, Probably a fuse gone somewhere. Yeah, maybe. Lights are on a separate fuse, generally. Huh. There you go. So let me uh, share a screen and we can get started. Uh, let me go there. Share. Beautiful. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. cool. Beautiful. Yes. So we have. Um, now that I'm sharing that screen, then I can always do this. And then we have, there are two cases. One is an older one that we haven't went through last time. And then there's a new one. Um, from what, what I remember last time, we want to be organized and we don't want to jump over new cases. So let's, let's continue in order. So let's go through case 70. Um, and let me share that case, the link through the chat. Okay, there it goes. Um, okay, so I can move this out of the way and then I'll open the case. Let me go back and try to find the history. Okay, so this should be case 70. Is an older cat, unwell for three weeks, fever, lethargy, cough for 24 hours. I don't think there is anything else we know. And then there are three images, like a, kind of a routine thorax. Morning, everyone. Sorry for the Morning. Late. Hello. Morning. Not, not too late. We we have a five minute tolerance. <laughs> so you are still within the accelerator. Really? I used to have like a like a professor at the uni and he would just lock the door at like five past. So if you weren't there, you go home, you're not gonna manage to get in. Five mm -hmm. after five. So that's okay. After five minute post, you know. I'm still so, in, I'm still in. You are stay, still within the range. So, okay, the three images as usual. I think, well, probably this one you can rely on my screen, but it's always a good idea to open your the link on, in your computer and take a closer look because you can play with the images. But again, we do what we always do is we just describe and then I take notes and then we discuss. Something that we haven't talked like um, in detail or we haven't kind of stopped to discuss that issue um, but we talked about it peripherally is that in theory, I always go with, is it normal or abnormal? If you really, and I, I make this and I kind of suggest that there should be an organized approach. Um, even though that sounds very nice and probably we should try to push ourselves to be organized. Reality is usually more disorganized and you can control how your brain goes. So you can, but at least to have in mind an assessment of the quality of the image. And if you can do that first, it's a good idea because if you can capture something that is wrong technically, that may influence how you read things. Make sense? So like a classic example would be if the limbs are not, I can give you two or three. So if the limbs are not pushed cranially, that, that's something that to take note about because then that can explain increased kind of opacity in the cranial thorax. 
So probably you, you, at the end of the report, you are not going to conclude with a lot of certainty that there is something in the thorax if the limbs are like that. Makes sense because, or at least you need to look around and, and convince yourself that it's not due to abnormal or suboptimal positioning. Another one would be if it's very rotated, you know, what about the shape of the heart? Can you still, you know, be look at that very closely? Probably not. Makes sense? So if you can mentally go through the technique first and see if there is anything that either would dequalify, unqualify the image to, you know, as, as, a, as a diagnostic image, that's a good point. Or if you can identify things that are gonna challenge your interpretation, I think that's another important point. You, we usually don't do that or yeah, or probably we do it too fast, but I think it's worth doing that because there are gonna be many situations that can be confusing with a, a disease and those are technical or <clears throat> normal variations. And you know, having those in mind, not to make a mistake is kind of a good idea. Well, okay, I already talked too much. Uh, but if, if someone gives me this case, my first comment will be, it's technically beautiful. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I don't think I can pick any, any issue with the technique. It's not rotated. The exposure is beautiful. Everything that we are interested in is exposed. Makes sense. So it's part of the image. So that is kind of one take and I'm, I, I'm not even, now I'm, I don't think I can blame technique for anything. Cool. Um, yeah, I would say the cardiac silhouette is effaced. Okay, what do you mean by decreased? Effaced, sorry. Um, okay, I like that. Yeah, the borders are effaced. Um, the trachea is dorsally displaced based okay. on the lateral views. Okay. Mm, there is a um, soft tissue opacity, um, diffused, but more severe in the left hemithorax okay. on the ventrodorsal view. I, I would say kind of a diffused non-structure insert tissue pattern. Okay. Also say it appears to have pushed the trachea and the um, bifurcation to the right in the dorsal ventral view as if it did have a, a kind of a, like I thought it was a plural effusion, but there's kind of a mass effect there. I, I love that sentence, the whole thing, the whole thinking. Uh, so we are gonna, the way that I wanna take note of that is that the trachea seems to be displaced, not only dorsally, but to the right. And then there's a question mark in terms of how to interpret that. Yeah, be, that, that's a beautiful point for this for discussion. Um, you can't see the diaphragm on the left-hand side of the thorax on the BD. And beautiful, another, another very important point. So, so this effacement, we can use the same word of the di of the left hemithorax, a hemidiaphragm. Okay, very good. I think there's also um, uh, movement of, well, the, the lung fields on the left hemithorax are not extending all the way to the edge of the thoracic cavity. And there's a soft tissue density or fluid density there, um, which I, it could be fluid plus or minus a mass, I would be thinking. Can, can mm -hmm. do you mind showing um, that exactly what do you mean? I'm in looking, of, where in the image is that? I'm looking back here. I feel like I can see the borders of the lungs here. And it also looks to me like we have um, 
air bronchograms or air tracheograms in this area. So increased opacity in the right cranial lobe. Beautiful. So, um, so another way to describe that, the I mean this part, this component, is that I'm, I'm sure you said that, but is there is a separation of the lung from the thoracic wall. Because we can, we unless we believe that this is not the border of the lung and the lung goes all the way and there is something in the lung, then you, you could conclude that these are the borders of the lung, which in theory should be against the wall. And now they are being displaced and there is something in between them. But this is an extremely uh, important point. So this uh, first is your ability to identify some lung lobes on the left. They are smaller and they are separated from the wall. Very good. So left for lungs, small, we can call them atelectatic uh, and separated from the wall. Okay. So the gastric axis shifted cranially. Okay. How much? So this, this should be the pylorus here and that should be the fundus. And in, I agree, so in theory, that should be parallel to the ribs. And then it's almost, it's kind of perpendicular to the spine. So yeah, okay. So this cranial displacement of the gastric axis. Um, it, something very cool is happening now. You are very good in picking things. And what I found, found myself doing is somehow translating that into how I would describe that in a report. And hopefully, it's not that I'm a good model or anything, but you will realize that it's always the same. <laughs> Make sense? It's always the same. It's always the same features. That's why the report is usually boring. Make sense? So the features, you can look at this video again, whatever. What I'm writing are the words that we usually use to describe things. And we don't, it's like in, and, in, and you may not be interested, you may be interested more in what's happening with the image. But if you're interested in the description, basically the what happens is that there is kind of, uh, the way that I imagine that is like a, a set of boxes. And then the set of boxes is, you know, is silhouetting displacement. Uh, you know, those are the boxes. And those are the words that we use is, um, and then we say, this is in that box, that is in that box, makes sense? So, and then it becomes very easy to describe something. It's all about the size, shape, contours, opacity, and location, you know? And then you identify something and then the description becomes relatively easy. And the, the idea with a resident is that by, when the resident is be sitting the exam, then, this should be an automatic process. It should be all about the recognition and then how you describe should come like automatically. And it's kind of happening now, which I enjoy. Um, and I, I, I don't mean you to copy what I'm saying, but I mean to tell you that at the end of the day, it's always the same thing that is happening. Uh, so if you can get familiar with a set of words, then it's just playing with those, you know, back and forth. Okay, anyway, what else? We can also see um, the right cranial lung view is as well. Um, well, I can see it border and um, I can see as well, yeah, this soft tissue opacity, the little triangle in front. Okay, okay. So like it is I'm... minimally retracted. Okay, cool. So this, our idea or our expectation about how far the lung should ex extend to is to the level of the first rib. So in theory, this should not stop there. It should go at least there. Um, and then it should probably not be that rounded and it should be anything soft tissue like that. So all good points. And that's gonna be the right cranial lung. Okay, anything else? 
the the liver uh, lobes are identify the liver's identifiable. Excellent point. Um, where are we? So again, going back to describe our report, we will call that good trusal detail. Makes sense. So, and that's an extremely important point because then we will see. I'm sure you're already thinking that one of the possibilities. I'm not saying that is for sure that, but one of the possibilities is whatever is abnormal in the thorax is going to be due to effusion. And then, so knowing if effusion is in one cavity or bicavitary is is very important. So that point, even though it's let's say a negative, is is a no. There is no that. Uh, I think is very important. So yes, we can see the border of the, the liver. If we go back to the, the principles, we do see that border because it's surrounded by something that is not soft tissue. And that, that's the falciform ligament. Uh, and that is telling us that there is no fluid, at least in the part of, the, in the imaged portion of the abdomen, there is no evidence of free fluid, which is a very important point. Okay, so no peritoneal effusion. Okay, anything else? You've been extremely good describing this time, huh? And my suggestion, sometimes we do, sometimes the images are clear enough and we do kind of pattern recognition and, and we know that it's probably not the best, but some, it, it, I don't think we can control that alone. So when we see, we identify ourselves doing that. There are certain things that we need to do not to go to that set of mistakes. But there is another situation where, is, where if we, do, we don't do pattern recognition because we don't recognize anything. When that is the case, what we've done is the best. It makes sense you go feature by feature and then you kind of analyze one and the other. It makes sense? So I, 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 there is a lot of literature saying, you know, you should do it one way or the other. I don't think you are, on a, you, you control all of that. Most of it goes unconsciously. But at least you can be aware where are the, the weaknesses and, and strengths of each way, pattern recognizing or, um, or going, analyzing every feature. Okay, so if there is nothing else that you want to mention, then it's time to start um, trying to explain what happens. Happening. One last thing, Mariano, and I think it, it could just be normal, but um, the last sternobray as well, um, I think it might just be the way, like on the different laterals when they're kind of taken, looks like it's mobile, but I think it's probably just positioning. But that's the only last thing I was kind of wondering about. Okay, so this is kind of a, a small detail, but from why are you saying mobile? because it's a, it has a different position between the two projections. Yeah, so it looks like it's kind of hinging, but I know it's kind of articulating like cartilage, that kind of thing. Um, um, and, that, and I guess like the ribs and sternum are meant to be quite mobile generally as, as part of their job. Um, so I assume it's that, that's the case, but I guess I was just wondering if there's an abnormality there that could bring things like trauma and contusions into it as well, but um, um, as a possible differential. But yeah. Okay, so this is a, a very good point. And I remember when I, I, the, 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 the thing that comes to mind immediately is I remember doing uh, labs with students and that was the best thing. And then they removed them, but uh, that was the best for, for a learning situation. And what was that? So basically we would give them in a computer lab, give them cases like we are doing now. We would let them on their own. They didn't like that uh, for an hour or two. And then we would just discuss the cases. And in the meantime, I would just go around and then asking them. Some of them were very shy, would never tell any, say anything. But some of them were very engaging. And then, and the reason why I'm going there is one of the things that I, identify, and there's no literature about this, but I, can, I could see it happening all the time, is when, so one of the things about experience is that you can first identify what is abnormal and probably because you can recall 
different disease processes, you can kind of say, well, this looks like that. And another thing which no one talks about, um, but I think is almost as important, is being able to know or trust whatever is normal. And how is that expressing or, or coming to someone that is starting? Like in, in this case, uh, a student, I remember this happening all the time. It would be something very obvious and they will be stuck with something very minimal, a normal variation or actually something that looked normal. And they couldn't get out of that. Makes sense because they, for them, that was something important and they, so they couldn't get out. So this, this goes away. I, Sometimes, sometimes we struggle with things and at the end of the day we say, well, maybe it's a normal variation. And, and I have one, so all of this is to make a suggestion and to say, okay, and you, you went that way. You said, well, I'm not sure about that. That it meant to have some motion because you know there is breathing and then the thoracic wall should move. Uh, another explanation about that distance is maybe cartilage. And then you, even though what you said, well, but it could also be trauma. But I love, I love that statement. So then the way out of this situation is to start playing the, like the hypothesis game. So if you say, well, what if it's trauma? And then if it's trauma, then you should kind of picture or color a picture where there should be something else, make sense? So there should be some degree of fracture to any cartilage. There should be soft tissue swelling, some gas in the wall, make sense? So can you find additional evidence for trauma? And then even though probably you, you still don't know what is going on, you at least feel more comfortable in saying, well, I, I don't know what that is, but I consider two or three options that I think are the most likely, but then don't really fit because it's just a single feature and th there is, more evidence for in any of those uh, hypotheses is missing. Make sense? And then you just, that's the way to throw it. Um, you can even describe it and say, you know, I see that and I don't know what it is, but I don't think it's this, this and this because of this, this and this. Make sense? So you can put that thinking. Uh, if you are verbally reporting, you can do that. If you are, is this is your case, you can just convince yourself about that, but that should be the thinking process. You you. And once you see it, you, you, can't, you can't let it go. You need to find an explanation. And it may be something normal. Like in this case, I think it, that's completely normal. But by me telling you that it's completely normal, that it, that's not gonna avoid your brain going there next time to something similar, makes sense? So I'm trying to give you a tool to, to deal with things like that. So you identify them, you cannot let them go. Anything that you identify needs to be explained. And in this case, you just do the same thing, hypothesis testing. And in this case, everything else is missing. There is no other evidence of trauma. So a trauma that uh, laxated that or fractured that then should have fractured some cartilage. You are lucky the cartilage are mineralized. So then you can assess that. There's no fluid. Yeah, so unlikely to be relevant. In this case, yeah. So there's no lysis if you think about an aggressive lesion. Makes sense, so it's, there's no periosteal reaction. So that, that would be the way that I, I tackle that. Again, I insist, uh, sometimes the experience is not so much to identify things, but also to let some things go. Um, and I remember with the students, I remember spending probably more time in their, trying to explain their irrelevant findings rather than to spending the time in the relevant finding. And, and this is not to say that they were silly or whatever, this is what happens. This is how we learn. The brain kind of adjusts uh, after you look at many, 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 many. And now that you question that, I'm sure the next 10 thorax, you're gonna look at that. And then your brain kind of gets a new normal and then you, then you are comfortable again. Okay. One last thing. There is like a little small um, bronchogram just okay. ventral to the tracheal bifurcation in the right lateral? Yeah. Here. Well, actually in both, but it's, I can clearly identify it in the right lateral. Yeah. Okay, are we ready to start hypothesizing what is happening? 
did you also agree, um, Mariano, that um, there was increased uh, opacity in the right cranial lobe on the DV view? The um... mm, in the right cranial. So yeah. I don't agree. I would say the way that I would describe that is that there's a you, you can use again the same words caudal displacement of the cranial border of the right cranial angle. Makes sense of this to be there and it caudally displaced. And I would say that there is a soft tissue, there is a rounded contour. This is a bit too rounded, but this, that's a detail. And that, that would probably go up to there. Um, and I agree, I agree with that point. The border in between what I think is the lung, so the border of the lung seems to be very well defined. So I'm, I'm probably going to use that to say that whatever is producing that displacement is outside the lung. Makes sense that this is not this is not within the lung. So whatever is out, whatever is here, where the lung should be sitting, is not part of the lung. It's outside the lung. And that, the reason why I'm going to be saying that I'm now moving on into interpretation is that that board, I, I cannot see that border. So let me draw. So there are post two, I guess, two possibilities. One is like we have a normal lung that goes up to there, and then you kind of don't see this part, but that, that would be a normal lung low, let's say, something like that. And then, then there is a lesion within, so then it's, it's going to be like that. So if that is the case, then these are the kind of borders that you will see. Some, some degree of the aerated lung is going to go around some kind of lesion, or there may be air bronchograms. Um, the problem in this case is that this border for me is this border that is being displaced. Makes sense? So this is there. And then therefore, I will, my interpretation will be that this is, an, let's say, a, no, a smaller, less aerated lung, but without a primary lung, a lung disease, that the reason why it's being small and covered in space is because something wrong outside that lung. That, that, that would be my, my, my thinking process. Right. I hope I answered your question. Um, and does that explain sort of the increased opacity in this area that you just have... Um maybe partial atelectasis as well. It looks like you've got um, air bronchograms or air tracheogram, but we don't know if that's infiltration in the alveolar space or if it's just um, sort of compressed alveolar space. So what we clearly see in, in here, the, the feature that I would pick is the feature that the trachea is displaced. And that's why having a perfectly straight radiograph is so helpful because it's not severely displaced, but the projection is perfectly straight and the trachea actually does go to the right. So that would be the point that I would take. I would probably have a different explanation for the um, border effacement of the heart. I think we, there is still some, so remember, that they, there cannot be an air bronchogram in the trachea because the definition of the air bronchogram is an airway that is surrounded by soft tissue and the soft tissue is the lung. So basically the, air, the idea of an air bronchogram is reserved for airway within the lung. In theory, there is always an air bronchogram or a, a tracheal bronchogram because the trachea is always surrounded by soft tissues. Right, yeah, it's just shifted. It's shifted. Yeah. So then I will not be too concerned about the outside of the trachea because it's always, remember that in a, in a radiograph, if we are able to see the wall of the trachea, Make sense? So, so the outer border, the wall, and then the inner border. The inner border we always see because there is gas. Then we jump on that and we say there is pneumomeria steinum and because yeah. there is gas. So basically there is no, we, the normal is not to be able to see the outer contour of the trachea. So if in, if in this case you don't see the outer contour of the trachea, then we are dealing with something normal. Make sense? It's the whole, so another way probably to call this is to say, instead of saying 
I mean, it's not wrong, but you say the trachea is displaced. Actually, the conclusion to that finding is not the trachea is displaced, it's a mediastinal shift. Yeah. It's the, the, the trachea is telling you that the mediastinum is shifted, the whole thing. Now, the trachea is a visible component of that mediastinum, but usually the trachea doesn't go away from the mediastinum. Make sense? So, um, hopefully, I answer your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, explanations. We, we are still now trying to explain the findings. So you mean like... Um, What's happening? You know, how can you explain? Yeah. As a summary, I think if I go through the, the findings, there is effacement of the cardiac silhouette, effacement of the left hemidiaphragm, there is a mediastinal shift, um, there's interstitial pattern in the right lungs. Um, there is rounding and caudal displacement of the right cranial lung low. There is good serosal detail and normal gastric axis. Th those those are, the, are the findings. Now we need to explain which kind of disease process can result in this. If you don't, I, actually I would suggest not going to that disease process, but going, you know, the first attempt should be to try to localize where is this disease going on? Is it in the wall? Is it in the pleural space? Is it in the lung? Is it in the mediastinum? Is it fluid? Is it a mass? Is it a combination? It makes sense, that, that kind of assessment. And then after we go through that, then we can try to identify a disease process that can result in disappearance. Yeah, okay. So for me, the disease is located in mostly in the pleural fusion. I sorry, okay. in the pleural space. Yes. And it's more likely to be liquid than a mass, so pleural fusion. Okay. Um, but I think um, the dorsal displacement of the trachea, even if it's not severe, makes me think about the cardiomegaly as well. Cardiomegaly, okay. Okay. I hope we have people ready to argue against that. <laughs> to, to challenge those Me ideas. Me too. I'm gonna I'm gonna go for something different. I'm gonna say cranial mediastinal mass, probably mainly okay. right sided. I think the right sided. Sorry, left sided, left sided. Yeah. <laughs> um and the I, I think the left sided effacement is probably pleural effusion because it seems very diffuse um, as opposed to a mass but there could be soft tissue stuff in there as well that we can't see um, so I'm going to go cranial mediastinal mass with the left-sided pleural effusion. Okay so basically you are almost in agreement but you are saying in addition to whatever you said there, there's there's a cranial mediastinal mass which may be the beginning of the story. Yeah yeah, because I that agree. Would, that would push the trachea up. Um, yeah. You'd get the mass effect with the trachea to okay, the right. Okay. And um, I guess just the left hemithorax is the bit of the unknown quantity, whether it's fluid or soft tissue. But it seems so diffuse, I'd probably punt for fluid over soft tissue, but I'm not sure. Beautiful. Any, anyone else? I remember, I, I give you a little bit of a whatever. Um, I found that I have a contrarian personality. So if you push me one way, I like to go the other way. So, and I had that, and I was a little bit like annoying uh, during my residency. And then, but then, then I, because I enjoyed, I, I, let's say, encouraged people to be like that when I was training other people. So I, I even, I, I remember playing the kind of the pro, a professional um, disagreeer, you know, whatever you say, I will find an argument against. Devil's advocate. Yes, exactly. And it came so natural to me. And I think it's a beautiful exercise and it should not be taken personal. It makes sense? It's, it's an exploration of ideas. So let's see if we have any devil's advocate, you know, any, anyone that wants to argue against it. 
or to find the weakness of that idea? Is, is there any point where that argument is thin, you know, where we can just break it? That, I would be like when all my racing mates were doing this exercise, this would be in the morning, every day, we would do this, we would pick a case or two and then have this discussion. I would always disagree, always disagree. But just, <laughs> you know, for the fun of it, yeah. So any any disagree is disagreement. Any anyone that wants to either find a new explanation or challenge, or say you know if if this is like this, why is this not happening? Why is this you know asking for more explanation? I'll disagree with myself. As no one else is popping up, um, you could argue the fact that you've got the right displacement of the trachea fluid wouldn't do that necessarily that's a the fluid like pleural effusion on the left side on its own wouldn't cause displacement or would it i don't know maybe it huh. would but then you're not contradicting yourself you are supporting yourself because you are i think by you bringing the the cranial external mass that in your case is somehow a little bit to the right which I, I love because usually the mediastinal mass are in the middle. That's why it's called mediastinum. But, you know, mass is, it can be not perfect. So it could go a bit to the right. So I'm okay with that. And then, so I think you are the one bringing an explanation that explains actually the mass effect that we are seeing. So I feel that your comment is supporting your, your diagnosis rather than challenging it. But I guess you could argue a cranial mediastinal mass isn't going to cause displacement of the bifurcation right the way back, is it? Okay, okay, yeah. You displace the cranial trachea, but it wouldn't be pushing it that far back, would it? Or if the mass is large enough to displace the heart. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, any other argument? I do have an argument to both, to both comments. I just think something has to be pushing the trachea dorsally. I think that's quite extreme. Um, although it does it doesn't look as bad on the left lateral, I have to say. But in the right lateral, I, I feel convinced that it's either a large heart or a cranial mediastinal mass. I don't think fluid can push it dorsally, but I think fluid could push it laterally, unilateral fluid. So one point that I find weak about this core hypothesis is that we have a, a so there is a mediastinal mass that we don't see because it's effacing with the pleurification, which will not be the first time that that happens. That, that's a very common thing. The, the component that I don't like is the asymmetry of the pleurification. Why, why is the effusion on one side? Because you've got an intact mediastinum. Yeah, it's probably not. Uh, transudate, it's probably pus or chyle, maybe it's thicker. Okay, but then that, okay, so then you want to make an abscess in the cranial mediastinum. Because usually, I mean, we are not giving a name, but if there's a cranial mediastinal mass, I mean, if it's it considered a thymoma or a lymphoma, then in that case, usually it's a modified transudate and the classic appearance, I mean, not every case, but Usually, there is a fusion and it's not perfectly symmetrical, but it's affecting both ME axes almost in the same way. Again, because it's not the condition to have a unilateral is either the fluid is very inspissated and they can go, or there was a previous or an anatomical variation. Some animals don't have that communication, or there was a previous chronic pleuritis, and then those communications or penetrations were you know, see. So usually that's not the case in, in, in a, premi a pure cranial mediastinal mass, and then we have a fluid in both sides. So that would be one of one of the things that I will be asking for explanations. You know, how in, in, in your hypothesis, how can you explain that? There is one another point that I was waiting for to bring it, but and before I forget, I need to bring it to the conversation. And is that we don't rely or we should not when we think let me restate when we think there is plural effusion the plural effusion on itself 
So without having a mass in the cranial median stunning, just the fusion can result, and usually does, results in dorsal displacement of the trachea. Okay, so this, if you go in the book, and I can try to find it now, right. it says, don't rely on dorsal displacement of the trachea as a mass effect if there is pleural effusion. That doesn't mean that I can rule out mass. There could be a mass, be, and it could be silhouetting. That, I'm, I'm not able to rule it out, but I cannot use that feature to support it. Like so, so it could be a hypothesis that there is a mass, like any other hypothesis, but not based on the dorsal displacement of the trachea. The book continues and it says, if it, there is pleural effusion and there is narrowing of the trachea, even more if there's focal narrowing of the trachea, then you can think about a mass effect because fluid on its own cannot result in narrowing of the trachea, but it can result in dorsal displacement. I hope I was clear enough communicating that statement. I can yeah. really copy yeah. it. Um, it makes sense. Okay. One point that we are we are going very thin now is that if the fusion is by so I would still take so uh, uh, let's go an uh, infusion like like a normal infusion like the, uh, an infusion that moves freely around the lung lobe from one side to the other, cannot explain, it can explain the dorsal displacement, but it cannot explain the right displacement. There's, there's, we need an explanation for right, for that displacement of the trachea to the right. That should not happen, and it does not happen, when there is just if you, no, normal effusion, let's say, like a normally, the normal effusion is the one that just goes evenly around the lung lobes. Uh, which is a modified transudate or transudate uh, hemorrhage, you know. Okay, th I wanted to make that point clear because that I will save you from mistakes. You you can't use that feature. I'm not saying that there is no mass there, but if you want to document the mass, you need ultrasound. You need to remove the fluid and take another radiograph. The 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 if you have evidence of pleural effusion, then you can you need to tolerate the dorsal displacement of the trachea. And the same thing goes for the uh, comment about the possible cardiomegaly. You can't conclude that, unfortunately. It's like we are, we are blinded there, we, we should not. So again, the way out would be ultrasound or remove the fluid and take another radiograph. Now I want to continue with the idea, uh, let's, let's dive deeper into how can we explain the right cranial, the, the right displacement of the trachea. Or, or, or in, in another word, so you can put it together, how can you explain this asymmetric distribution? Because I think that's the, that's the hot feature, that, that's, the, that's the very strong feature. It's, it's an asymmetric distribution and there's a massive effect coming from the left hemithorax. That is probably the summary, the core of the case. It's an asymmetric disease with a mass effect in the left hemithorax. So the question is, how can we end up with that? I can't answer your question, but I, I, what I'm confused at is it's very, it's an asymmetric picture, but the trachea is displaced very, it's very straight. It's not, there's not a, a, a pinpoint area where there appears to be more pressure on it. It's like the whole of the right, well, it's not even right, the whole of the lungs are displaced to the right. I agree. I think and that's I, significant, but I, I can't explain why. Probably a, a, good, a good way to, to think about that, and I completely agree with your finding. It would be, instead of something like directly pushing the trachea, we can think about something moving the whole uh, mediastinum. And so, so if there is nothing pointy, like a mass, but there is something yeah. big moving the whole the whole mediastinum, then there is no need. Or you can even go further and say if there is something move, moving the, the the heart, then then the trachea comes with the heart. Makes it make sense? 
So it's yeah. not that you are directly pointing or pushing the trachea, but you are basically the whole uh, mediastinum is being displaced to the right. So we talk about the trachea because we see it, but the proper way to call this is a mediastinal shift. So there is an asymmetric disease process. I think it's in the pleural space. In the left, limited to limited or a lot more severe in the left hemithorax with an associated mass effect. That, that's the core, that's the summary. How can we end up with that? Okay. Now we're Mariana, going to... have, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, could you have, I, I'm, I don't think it's the case, but could you have a mediastinal, mediastinal shift if you have a whole hemi, like pulmonary hemithorax that is mm, um, I collapsed with a telectasia? Could this give you a mediastinal shift? Absolutely, and that, that would be a case of a unilateral pneumothorax. Makes sense? Okay. So you have unilateral pneumothorax, then there is gas in that hemi, in that hemi pleural space, in the pleural space on that side. The lungs are smaller, and then the heart shifts to that side because it's empty. Makes sense? The, the, there's yeah. no lung, lung is smaller. So per, uh, another very, and now we are going big, big concept, but very, very useful concept. Anytime you think you see a medicinal shift and you're convinced about it, because it could be rotation and other things. You, two very important points. You can either pull or push. That's it. Is it either one or the other? So now you need to start thinking, you know, is there, is there something pushing or something pulling? Right, yeah. But in this case, when you have a telectasia, then you would you would see the lung lobes um, more dense, like with a, an interstitial yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, or pattern. What I don't like about that argument, the argument that I the chairman against the pneumothorax that I was pointing out. The pneumothorax, so it's gonna be gas in that hemithorax. The lung lobes are gonna be atelectatic, therefore smaller. In that case scenario, then the heart is gonna to shift towards that side. Makes sense because it's empty. The, the lung is smaller. So why ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. The animal is gonna be compensating by hyperinflating the unaffected lung lobe. So those are gonna get larger. So there is every, every possible reason to think about the heart moving to the affected side. There is an exception to the rule, and the exception to the rule, which I'm more than happy to bring a case because I love this, is a tension pneumothorax, where the, the pneumothorax is not only gas, but there's gas under pressure. And that whole pleural sac is acting like a mass. Make sense? And then in that case, then it's going to be, and this is the whole mark of attention pneumothorax, it's going to be media standard shift to the unaffected side. Make sense? Because now, now the affected side has increased pressure because it's attention pneumothorax, there is a valve. And now this, like in this case, actually the, the trachea is moving to the unaffected or the least less affected side, hemithorax. Mm -hmm. I guess um, you've got like the mass effect on the left side. It's either like a diffuse mass that's causing the general push. I guess the other option is it's got like a diaphragmatic hernia, although its liver looks in the normal place. So, but it, I guess it could be fat or momentum or something because we can't see the diaphragm on the left side. Um, and then fluid as well. And fluid as well, yeah. So I have no arguments to your, your first lines, which were the diaphragmatic hernia. So the diaphragmatic hernia is the diagnosis, is two, two aspects of the diagnosis. One is if you actually see abnormal structures in abdominal structures in the pleural space or in the, in the thorax, and that's the easy. And the difficult one is the indirect. And the indirect are three, three features we look for. The cranial displacement of abdominal structures Displacement of thoracic structures, like in this case, there is a shift. So it could be something in the left hemithorax that actually, it could be the spleen, makes sense, on the left hemithorax that it went up through the diaphragm. And then effacement of the diaphragm. And it's indirect because we don't see, we see the consequence, okay? 
In this case, I would probably, I like your consideration. I think we cannot remove it completely out of the list. I don't see a lot of displacement in the abdomen. I, the abdomen looks very quiet. I would expect more displacement, but I think your consideration is beautiful. And then um, you had another, what was your second consideration? The consideration was, uh, what if it's all fluid? And I want you to explore that option. What if it's all pleural effusion? Well, you said that fluid can't push the trachea laterally, so it can't be all fluid. Um, I guess it could be like a mass in fluid, and we just can't see the actual outline of the mass. But it, I guess the mass would have to be relatively diffuse to cause the sort of general push of the trachea rather than like a curve, like Jill said. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So I, for some reason, I remember like music. You know, music it, it builds sometimes attention and then they start to release the tension. So I think now we are at the time to, for me to release the tension. We build enough tension. So the answer to this case is one of the exceptions that I mentioned. I said fluid, if, you know, the, I give you, gave you exceptions about when, how we can have unilateral diffusion, and one was if we have inspissated fluid. So this is exactly how a biothorax or could look like. I'm not saying all biothoraxes look like this, but this is a unilateral pleural effusion. And it's, it's acting like a mass. And it's the reason because of this is, and this is a confirmed case. Um, the reason is because the fluid now is not free. Make, makes sense, it's kind of, we call it pocketing of fluid in the pleural space. And the minute that you start having pockets is the minute that those pockets are acting like masses. Make sense? They, are, they can't move around, the fluid cannot move around and it's acting like a mass. So this, uh, the way to summarize this is an asymmetrical distribution of pleural effusion. One of the differentials that you need to be thinking, including media standard shift uh, is pyothorax. So it's still a pleural disease, but now we have a reason why it's so unilateral and why it's acting like a mass. Someone could ask, ask me, um, could there be, in addition to that, a mass in the mediastinum, I said, yeah, we could, you know, obviously, uh, there's effusion, so I don't see it. It could be the probably most important point is if you get to this point, what to do next to, to confirm that? Well, you obviously put a needle in there. And in terms of the imaging aspect, every time there is effusion, we want to first take without removing the effusion and then remove the effusion and take a new set of radiographs. And obviously the way to go in this case before doing that is ultrasound. Makes sense to you. Now, now you're gonna be able to see uh, separate the heart from whatever's in the pleural space and see if there's anything else in that pleural space. And be aware that I'm saying asymmetrical distribution is not purely on one side. And that's why I like the comment about the lung, the right lung not going all the way because I think there is bilateral effusion. There is a bit of separation of the lung from the wall as well. There's rounding of the contour, but it's clearly an asymmetrical process. And a further evidence that there is effusion on both sides is that the silhouetting of the cardiac silhouette, which if that, I think that is supporting the idea that there is some degree of pleural effusion on the right as well. So it's bilateral pleural effusion. I, by having that hypothesis, we can explain everything. We can explain why the borders of the lung are separated from the wall, but there seems to be nothing happening within that lung other than atelectasis. Uh, why there is a uh, mesial shift um, and why there is silhouetting, obviously of the left hemidiaphragm, but also of the cardiac silhouette and why there is warming of this contour of the lung. Are you happy with the solution or you are unhappy? with all the tension building and then the release. I feel like it break all the usual rules this case. It's like, oh, so that, it doesn't normally push the trachea, but in this case it did. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not saying that every case is gonna present like this. I'm, I'm not saying that. Sometimes it's still pocketing, asymmetrical distribution. And I'm not saying that in every case of a pyothorax is gonna look like this, but I'm saying a pyothorax can look like this. I'm, I'm trying to go through the reasons why 
uh, it, it can look like this. In my, the trachea probably is the, the one situation that is probably not as common, but it all depends on how much efficient it is on one hemithorax and on the other. The common feature that I would probably say that is present in every case of biothorax is the asymmetry. Because fluid doesn't move freely. So that, that's the big concept. And this came because of our other case. Do you remember that we had the other, and I promise that I will bring a case of biothorax. I'm trying to build a story around the cases. So you remember this case, I think it was this one. Yeah, yeah, and this was a case from the real life, you know? Do you remember that we had this hypothesis about it was unilateral one hemithorax and there was an ultrasound and it ended up being a bronchogenic carcinoma. And then, so in this case, do you remember that we had like an hour discussion that was very cool? And then one of the hypotheses was, well, there is something obstructing the airway. There is a telectasis. A, and the reason why we think there is a telectasis is because opposite to the biothorax, the heart seems to be shifted to the affected side. There seems to be no separation of the lung from the wall. Um, one of the arguments was um, there is no mass effect to the healthy side. So then a biothorax seems less likely. And based on this comment, I thought about presenting this, which looks similar but not, there are some hints there that is telling us that this disease process, even though it looks very similar, is different from this. And the differences are the direction of the mesonal shift and the, our ability to see the borders of the lung on this side. That, that changes the whole game. So this, this case is, in, in, is a response to that previous case. So trying to, similar, very similar, but there are small things that should warn you to go one way or the other. And this is kind of the fun thing, going in, going in a bit complicated. We, we, are, we can also go through. So in the future, I think now in my wish list, I'll have like a tension pneumothorax. Obviously, I'm not going to bring it next time because you're going to pick it up like this. But I sometime down the road, I want to bring one. And then we will come back to this discussion about media standard shift, which side, how we're going to use it. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool, Diana. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. Lots, lots, lots of take-home learning points from that one. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Mariano. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mariano. Quick yeah. question. Thanks. Just about, just about sharing the pictures. You were just sending them to us. Is that coming through as an email? because obviously I've got your thing from last night, which was K71. Yes. And when you are sharing the pictures of K70 with us, how, I'm not sure where to find that. Cause I was trying oh, to find it during your lecture just then. Are you part of these? Uh, so I've got yesterday's, your emails from yesterday, but that's not that one. And I haven't got another email from you this morning. Oh, no, the 70 was sent like a week ago or even two weeks ago because last week I was busy. Okay, so, so how did you share it? You said to me this morning, I've just, I've just shared that with you all. Okay, good. So, if, so I would highly recommend that you spend one minute and make sure that you are within here because if you are here, you can actually go through the history yeah. and then review all the cases. So if you're from here, you just click on the case so hang on, I'm, if I go back into rounds and you're just going topics and that will bring all the cases up. Absolutely, yes. And then, this, and then this is just a link. So if you click on the link, so for some reason you need to click twice, you need to click once and this will show up and then you click, either you click or you copy and paste on a browser and that's it, that, that's your case. And you have a, um, a Dicom viewer so you can manipulate the images, you can, open two windows or three windows at the same time and have the okay. same image. So I'm this just is, trying to and in, my eyes, 
in order to really squeeze this time and benefit from this time, the, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, usually I'm not, it would be great if I can have, I can be one week ahead, like we are now. So if you, now for next week, we are gonna talk about this case, 71. So you have like one week to go through that case. Okay. Okay. And then you, you come with your all your you know um, your questions Thoughts. rather than yeah. rather than going through the case as we go together because I think there's not too much time to think and sometimes it's good to you know do that in a quiet you know open the images take a look take notes go through the book make sense I think that's the yeah. that would be the that would be that would, that would be what I will be doing and then once I assess went through the book, clear up my questions. Then once there, I will come to rounds. Make sense? So yeah. then I can really, really uh, take advantage. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you now. I've got, I've got the list of cases up here. So if we do 71 next week, um, I'll be on the ball. Awesome, perfect. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks, Mariano. That was really good today. Very good. See you Thank next you, week. Mariano. See you next week. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.